thank you to Rupa and Amanda for leading us this morning. They did a great job. Give me a round of applause. That's great. Thank you. Uh, keep your Bibles open. We are uh, in uh, 2 Timothy. We're actually going to be focusing our attention on the second verse of chapter 2 that Henrik read for us. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified uh, to teach others. Now, I don't know if you've come across the journalist, uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, he uh, has written a number of books, made some very interesting observations. One of his books is called Outliers, and he uh, quotes a study uh, that was carried out by a psychologist called Anders Ericsson. And uh, Ericsson was looking at the Berlin Academy of Music. And uh, he was asking this question, what set apart the elite violinists from the rest? From those who were good violinists, but not the best. Those who were average, but not the best. Those who were amateurs. What was the difference? What made the difference? And he observed, and he, and he studied them for a, a long period of time, right from childhood all the way up to uh, kind of the tw early 20s. And he observed that the amateurs would... A practice for about 2,000 hours in total. Whereas the elites practiced for 10,000 hours in total. And Gladwell makes the point that to be an expert in your field, in your craft, means 10,000 hours of practice. And so he says, look at the Beatles. They performed for 10,000 hours before they made their break. Bill Gates engaged in 10,000 hours of programming before he dropped out of Harvard in his first year at university. And he makes the point that there are no kind of naturals in this. It's not natural talent. These are not prodigies that we're talking about. And neither are there failures. If you have put in your 10,000 hours, you will be an expert and you will succeed. And so I want to ask you right up this morning, what skills have you learned? What crafts have you mastered? Maybe it's knitting. Maybe it is bricklaying. We'll get to that in a moment. Maybe it is playing the cello or the violin. Maybe it's computer programming. How did you do it? And how long did it take you to do it? What I want to suggest to you this morning, and what we're going to be looking at in this series on making disciple makers, is that faith is more like a skill than a subject. It's like learning a craft rather than learning new information. And so as we talk about making disciple makers, we're not saying, right, we want to teach you the basics of the Christian faith. No. We want to encourage one another as we learn together the craft of disciple making. It's why on Alpha we always say, uh, you know, we're not here just to observe or learn about what Christians believe from a distance. It's a practical introduction to the Christian faith. So we're going to do the things that Christians do. And so right from the very beginning, we sing because Christians sing. We pray because Christians pray. We read the Bible because Christians read the Bible. So that's what we're looking at in this series. It's a four-week series, Making Disciple Makers. And we're looking at the beginning of that process as Timothy passes it on. Uh, sorry, as Paul passes it on to Timothy. Let me pray for us as we turn to this passage. Father, you have called us to be those who make disciple makers. And as we look at this craft, this skill that you are calling us to, may our our minds be focused, but uh, may our skills be sharpened as we look at this master craftsman, we look at the Apostle Paul and what he has to say to Timothy, that we might see disciple makers in abundance in this place as your kingdom grows. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, it was Stanley Hauwas, who is probably the uh, premier ethicist in uh, the world at the moment. He said, or he says, that disciple-making is like laying bricks, hence our wall. Do you like that? Have you sat there the entire morning thinking, why have they got a cement mixer up on the stage and a bunch of random bricks? Well, it's to remind you that disciple-making is like bricklaying. And if you want to know about bricklaying, ask Clinton. It's one of his many skills, I suspect. 10,000 hours? No. <laughs> and bricklaying is a craft. And the point Hauas makes is that you can't be told simply how to lay bricks. You can't read how to lay bricks in a book. You have to learn a particular set of skills. So you have to learn how to mix mortar. You have to learn how to build scaffolding. You have to know how to hold a trowel properly. You need to know what frogging is. Anybody know what frogging is? I only discovered this because was, it was in the article. So if, you are, if you've got a brick and you put your mortar on the top of it, you then frog it by kind of putting a little dent in it, so you create a vacuum, so when you put the other brick on the top, it kind of seals the two together. It's a trench that creates a vacuum to make that wall much more solid than it would be if you just slap the brick on the top. Louis knows that I... Uh, I've only just found that out, I could tell. <laughs> I knew what you were saying. Uh, but, and this is where I fall down, in order to really develop the craft, develop the skill, what have you got to do? You've got to lay bricks. You've got to practice. Uh, last year, when we had these galleries painted, uh, Nathan, uh, who was our site manager at the time, said to me, have you met the decorator, the painter who is painting this? Because he's done a great job. And, uh, and I said, no. And he said, do you know, he... Uh, is not allowed to paint anything for the first year of his training. He's a painter. That's all he does. He does this. That's his skill. That's his craft. And he wasn't let loose on any job, on any work, until he had put in the hours and he had practiced on countless trial projects for an entire year. It's amazing, isn't it? You have to practice. You have to start laying the bricks. You have to start painting whatever your skill is. So Hauas says, it is not enough to be told how to hold a trowel, how to spread mortar, or how to frog the mortar, but in order to lay bricks, you must hour after hour, day after day, lay bricks. So you need to learn some skills. You need to put those skills into practice and thirdly, you need to learn from the master. When you're learning a skill or a craft, I'm sure you're aware, those of you who have done this, imitation is key, isn't it? You're an apprentice and you need a master craftsman. And that's what we're looking at in this series. How can we become master disciple makers? We're using the term disciple makers uh, because I remember um, as we were thinking about this year of discipleship, Invest 2013 that we're in, we thought what we want to do is encourage us as a church to be disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And we were inspired a bit by uh, the launch in 1999 of uh, Rob Bell's church, the Mars Hill Bible Church. Uh, it was launched in a school gym and it grew incredibly quickly. Um, but he had a very clear in one sense, mission statement, or vision, if you like. But it was 18 pages long, which is a bit cumbersome. But you got the hang of it as you began, because it was 18 pages of this phrase, disciples making disciples, making disciples, making disciples, making disciples, for 18 pages. That was his vision. That's what he wanted to see. And in one sense, that is what we all want to see. But it leaves you with a sense that we are disciples first, and then, if we're lucky, we make disciples. 
And actually, that's not what we're after in this year of discipleship. We want each one of us to be disciple makers in our gut, in our sense of this is who I am. I am primarily, above everything else, a disciple maker. So it's a little shift in mindset. So how are we going to learn this skill of disciple making? Well, of course, we're going to learn it from the master disciple maker himself, the apostle Paul. And so we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And what we see here is Paul, the master craftsman, the expert disciple maker, apprentices Timothy, and now Paul wants Timothy to take over and start to apprentice others. And what is his advice in his final letter that he writes? What is his advice to this new disciple maker? There are three things. Know your thing, stay on task, and risk it all. Let's begin with the first one. Know your thing. What is Paul's thing? Look at verse 2. The things you have heard me say. What are those things that Timothy has heard Paul say? Well, look at chapter 1. It gives us some clues. In verse 14, he speaks of the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Something that is beautiful, a treasure to be cherished, to be cared for, to be guarded and looked after. Verse 13 speaks of this pattern of sound teaching. Here he's saying, look, there is a model, a prototype, what you might call, if you like, an architect's drawing or sketch, the brief that the craftsman has been given. In the Greek, the phrase sound teaching actually means healthy words, which I think sounds a lot more fun than being sound. And then Paul identifies what that is, verse 11. He says, it's the gospel. And Paul is the herald, the apostle, the, the one who's been sent out to proclaim and to teach the gospel. This is the thing he's talking about. The gospel is Paul's thing. And what he does right at the beginning in verses 8 to 10, he sketches out his thing. He gives us that architect's drawing. The essence, the heart of his disciple making. Look at verses 8 to 10. This is what it says of chapter 1. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. What's he saying there? Well, he's saying, first of all, that God does it all. It's his initiative. God is the one who saves us. That is the essence of the good news. It's a rescue. It's a deliverance. This is liberation. Christianity is not being good. It's not having a particular set of uh, moral beliefs or practices. It's not a code of behavior. It's not a heritage or a tradition. It is liberation from sin. The way sin can deceive us or enslave us or wound us. The good news of Paul's architect's brief, if you like, is that it is God who has set us free. It is God who rescues us. And so he says, look, we don't do anything. Second half of verse 9, it's not because of anything we have done. It's not that we deserve it. It is only because of his grace, his sovereign grace, that free, unmerited favor. God has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. And he has done it only because he loves us. Nothing more. And then he says, and all of that takes place, that great liberation, that great rescue, through Jesus. Through this man who lived, who died on a cross, and then rose from the dead. And Paul makes it clear that he believes that that resurrection destroys death. 
Not in the sense that no one dies anymore, but it, it nullifies it. It abolishes its significance. It overwhelms its impact, its power in our lives. And instead, he says, it brings life in all its abundance. It brings immortality, eternal life, not in a sense of escaping this world and going to heaven, but bringing the life of the age to come into the here and now. God's good life today. And we can enjoy that as we enter into a relationship with Jesus. As he wraps his arms around us, as our humanity is wrapped up in his. And so says Paul, we can choose life. And what I want to say this morning is the gospel, it is the disciple maker's thing. Paul goes on to say to Timothy in chapter 2 verse 8, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead. This is my gospel. You can't lay bricks without an architect's plan, at least not in any order. So you need to know your thing. Don't forget it. Don't think, hey, that was something for me when I became a Christian. Focus on it. Preach it to yourself. Every day. It's good for your soul as well as everyone else's. Know your thing. Secondly, stay on task. Uh, I enjoy watching grand designs. And uh, there's always a... Uh, the, the plot is always the same on grand designs, isn't it? Uh, and that is they have an amazing idea. It looks beautiful. They get the architect's plan. Looks fantastic. It's three-dimensional. You can go through it, uh, you know, because it's all on the computer. It looks amazing. Then the stress comes. Where's the stress? It's in the schedule of works. The suppliers let you down, and you can't actually get any work done until they arrive with that particular window from Germany, usually, or Sweden. The contractors working on that particular product kind of begin to fall behind. And so you see that the site, it can just sit there empty for months. The rains come, the roof's still open. We're wondering, are they going to do it? It's always the same, isn't it, every time. And Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, you've got to stay on task. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. Be strong, he says, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul is having a hard time. He's in prison, and because he's in prison, lots of his followers have abandoned him. Because he's in prison, lots of opponents are beginning to gain influence in his churches that he's planted, and they're beginning to go astray. And Paul wants Timothy to remain strong. And so he gives him the example of Onesiphorus. And he says, look, just beforehand, in the few verses before chapter 2, he remained strong when others didn't. He came to visit me in prison. He wasn't ashamed. But Paul is worried about Timothy. He thinks Timothy is wavering. He thinks Timothy is ashamed of his imprisonment. He thinks Timothy is afraid that he might face imprisonment himself. And so he says, come on, guard the good deposit. Protect this beautiful thing. Don't let it go. Don't lose it. Keep it as the pattern of sound teaching. Hold to the standard that you have declared in the past. Stay on track. Stay on task. And he says that because Paul knows that a church can die in three generations. The first generation believes the gospel. They know it. They talk about it. They love it. The second generation thinks it's just for when they became a Christian. And they don't think about it anymore. They assume it. And then they live as Christians without it. And then the third generation denies the gospel. You could see that happening in Ephesus. There are countless stories of that 
in the life of the church in its history. And Paul says to Timothy, don't assume the gospel. Stay on task. And he says more than that, don't stay, stay on task, not just by guarding it, but by passing it on, tr- entrusting it to reliable people. This is the schedule of works. The contractors are the reliable men, the project manager or the foreman. The subcontractors are the others. And of course, as you are working with a number of different contractors, clarity is key. Remember a friend of mine who was training with me at Wycliffe Hall, uh, worked for um, Accenture and was passionate about Gantt charts, schedules of work. And he had the most sophisticating looking things on his computer. And we decided one year that we would paint the junior common room and put in a little bar. And he came up with this most sophisticated Gantt chart for all of us to do that. Poor guy. We kind of looked at him and just went on and got on with it anyway. So what you need is a good induction, you need a good handover, you need to know what you're doing and when you're doing it. And that's why Paul says to Timothy in uh, chapter 2 verse 14, keep reminding people of these things, pass it on, build a team, identify your potential disciples, your apprentices, recruit them, train them, empower them to be disciple makers. Be intentional about it. He doesn't just say that to Timothy. He says that to every one of us. Just as Paul is doing to Timothy, Timothy needs to do himself. One commentator puts it like this. Entrusting the gospel was not simply a matter of a tap on the shoulder. It would require Timothy to teach and model the faith. So what Paul is saying to us this morning is, stay on task. Maybe he's saying, get on task. Don't assume apprentice. Don't assume the gospel. Apprentice others. And then thirdly, risk it all. You've got the architect's sketch, his drawing. You've got the schedule of works, but eventually at some point, the work has to start. You've got to get on site. The foundation is laid. The bricklaying begins. The planning, the preparation is over. The work starts, and you have got to put into practice the skill that you have learned. You've got to risk it all. You've got to back yourself. And so Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, how you live is as important as what you believe. That's why in verse 3 he says, join with me in suffering. Look right the way back, chapter 4, verse 1. He says, look, Timothy, I am persuaded of your sincere faith, but he's clearly concerned about his timidity. He says, verse 8, don't be ashamed. Verse 9, again, join with me in suffering for the gospel. It's something Paul has challenged Timothy on before. In his first letter in chapter 4, verse 16, he says to Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely. Theory, he says, must become practice. It's no good to say, I believe these things here without putting them into practice out there. And the extraordinary thing is, is despite these doubts and concerns. Paul risks it all on Timothy. It's obvious, isn't it? Timothy's young. He's still learning his craft. He's not the finished article. He's not the master disciple maker, but Paul hands over to him anyway. He's willing to risk it all in this young man. And as he kind of sends him off, he encourages him And challenges him with three vivid images, three metaphors that are all about skills and crafts. The first is the soldier. And he says to him, Timothy, you need to have this level of concentration. You need to be single-minded, devoted to your duty. Not distracted by civilian affairs, but determined to do what your commanding officer has asked you to do. What the, the man who recruited you has asked you to do. You need to be like a soldier. 
You need to have that degree of concentration. You need to be like an athlete. You need to have an extraordinary determination to win. And to win, you've got to compete according to the rules. What he means by that is disciple-making hurts. Disciple-making means suffering. Believing the gospel may mean imprisonment. It may mean rejection. It may mean persecution. But it will mean something because we're living out the death as well as the resurrection of Jesus. And Paul believed that passionately. And it's something, I think, in the West where we are very comfortable, all of us, with our lives. And we work really hard to make them even more comfortable, if we're honest. We find that difficult to understand. But for Paul, it was integral to his life as a disciple maker, to his life as a follower of Jesus. Suffering for the gospel could not be avoided. So he says, you have to be as determined as an athlete who wants to win that race. And the third picture, he says, is look at the farmer. You need stamina to do this work that God is calling you to. Being a disciple maker is hard work. It's hard graft. You get blisters on your hands when you're making a wall. It was funny because this is lightweight blocks. So I was like, great, lightweight blocks. Pick a few up. They're quite heavy. Just managed to make it in. And you realize my hands aren't used to manual labor. I put, thanks to uh, Louis, I put moisturizer on my hands. I thought I'd just admit that all to you. I'm not ashamed. But the truth is, is that the image here is of calloused hands that have been working the ground, tilling the soil. It's hard work. It's long hours. And Paul knows all of that. And yet still, he is willing to risk it all in Timothy. To give his apprentice his break. To give him the chance that he needs. So are you ready to risk it all? And what I want to say to you this morning is don't pretend. Don't have it all up here where we simply say, yes, I believe. But actually practice it. Don't pretend. Practice. And so just to wrap things up before we sing and we pray and we gather around the table together. As we begin this new series, Making Disciple Makers, where we begin is this idea that we have to pass it on. We're not just called to follow Jesus, we're called to make followers of Jesus, to make disciple makers. And the thing we are to pass on is the gospel. And so you've got to know your thing. Don't forget it, focus on it. Preach it to yourself every day. Know your outline, whatever that might be. This is only one of Paul's outlines. It's a simple one. Learn one and preach it to yourself every day. Know your thing. Secondly, stay on task. Don't assume the gospel. Apprentice others with it. So if you haven't joined a small group, even if you're in a connect group, I'd encourage you, join a small group. That's where we will gather around the word together. That's where we'll uh, apprentice one another, where discipleship will take place. And then thirdly, risk it all. Don't pretend. Practice it. So I want to leave you with this challenge, really. Start this week. Start this week. Let's have stories when we come back next week for the second installment of Making Disciple Makers. Of stories of disciple making. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? So why don't we stand? I'm going to pray. The band, if you want to come up. If somebody wants to pop down and let Jessica know, I think somebody might have done already.
Let's just allow the Spirit. to continue to speak to us. What is it he's saying to you? Where are you in this? Do you need to grab hold of the architect's brief again because you've forgotten what it is you're doing? Do you need to see where you fit in that schedule of works? Or do you need to roll up your sleeves and start doing this craft you've been learning about? Lord, we know we can't do any of these things without your power. And so we pray for your power. We pray for your spirit. Lord, we are like Timothy. We are not the finished article. It is scary. We do feel timid. We're not sure. And yet Paul trusts him. He risks it all on him. And you risk it all on us. So Father, I pray that as we kick off this series, we might uh, learn together what it means to be disciple makers, how to make disciples. And we might put that into practice. In Jesus' name we pray.